Hi everyone, this is Lola speaking. I am the coordinator of the Harvard and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center site for the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Now I just want to review a few housekeeping items before we get started. Participant microphones will be muted at entry. If you have questions during the event, please use the chat box. If you have technical difficulties, you can message myself or Kelsey. The session is being recorded and it will be emailed out to all participants once it becomes available on our website. If you have questions after the session, please email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. At the end of the month, MHTTC sends you a certificate of completion that you can submit to your particular board for continuing education credit. Please contact ifisher at c4innovates.com for more information on CEs after the event. These are some MHTTC acknowledgements. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and lastly, consistent with our actions, policies, and products. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Keshavan for introductions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lola, and good morning, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Vinod Srihari. Uh, Vinod is uh, a longtime friend and collaborator. He is currently professor of psychiatry at um, Yale University School of Medicine, and also the director of the STEP program, which is a clinical service, a coordinated specialty care program for psychosis um, in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, we know he is well known for his contributions to the area of uh, early intervention in psychosis going back over a couple of decades. Um, he was uh, one of the, he published one of the first two um, uh, evidence-based um, um, publications in the area of showing that coordinated specialty care services work better than uh, treatment as usual in patients with the uh, first episode of psychosis as part of um, the STEP program that he implemented uh, some years ago, and this, you know, the other one is, of course, the RAISE program that you all know about. So these are the two that have shown evidence of early intervention efficacy in first episode psychosis. The other important initiative that uh, Vinod has led over the last few years is a, in a, a, a the first North American study to um, show the effectiveness of um, public health campaign efforts to reduce what we call DUP or duration of untreated psychosis. In other words, reducing treatment delay in patients with the first episode of psychosis. Uh, you know, both of, both of these are really critically um, groundbreaking studies in the area of um, psychosis. And uh, Vinod is going to tell us more about the second one of these, that is the treatment delay reduction initiative, which was, I'm glad to say, um, uh, we were part of that study from Boston, being one of the two sites that conducted this study with, um, with Yale as the primary site. So Vinod is a friend, colleague, consultant, advisor, many different um, domains for us uh, over the years. And it's really great to have you, Vinod, so please take it away. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I always have trouble with keynotes, so I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, I have a backup plan. Um, so <laughs> let me see if this works. Uh, play slideshow. So um, I'm just going to ask Kelsey if you can see the slide, and then I'm going to, do you see the? It looks like it's still loading, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't come up yet. OK.
Still not up, huh? Yeah, still black screen. Okay, uh, so why don't I go to plan B, uh, which I think will work. Um, Try this again. So, that looks great. Okay, um, and I'm going to advance one slide just to make sure that's working. Did it go forward and back? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I see many familiar names and also uh, several uh, people uh, who I don't know. So I tried to put together a slide deck in talking with, with Cash and uh, exchanging with Kelsey. Enough information, I hope, to provide background to those who know nothing about uh, the work I'm about to present. Uh, but I also understand that you're interested in Massachusetts of possibly implementing some of the lessons of this study. So I have tried to put some slides uh, to describe some of the lessons we've learned, and I'll try to editorialize along the way uh, about how we've been thinking about this study as we've been publishing um, results so that that still continues to be a, a work in progress. So the primary aim, as Kesh mentioned, was to determine whether an early detection strategy, which we called mind map, um, would be more effective than usual detection in redu reducing DUP. So DUP was the was the target or the independent variable here that we sought to reduce. And the secondary aim of the original study was to also ask whether that reduction would improve outcomes beyond the effectiveness of existing coordinated specialty care clinics. I won't directly address the secondary. I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, but I thought for uh, purposes of uh, time and, and what you were interested in, I'm going to focus mostly on the primary aim. Um, the study was funded by the NIH, and, and uh, your site uh, was a key partner um, in this collaborative study. So I uh, remain very appreciative of all the assistance from many members of the team at Harvard over, I imagine, many generations of trainees and, and faculty as well. Um, in terms of disclosure, so as I mentioned, the, the work that I'm about to present was all funded by the NIH. I don't uh, have any financial conflicts relevant to this talk, uh, but I should mention that I have co-founded a company to assist um, agencies in implementing learning healthcare systems uh, as a a vehicle that the university recommended would be a more efficient contracting vehicle for, for services. So, um, but I think my main conflicts are my own ideologies on these topics. So you will tell me uh, when you disagree with me, I hope during the course of this talk. So uh, a slide I, I often present just a level set. Um, we all understand from the uh, epidemiologic literature that while we, still are puzzling about the causes and the mechanisms of these uh, psychotic illnesses, we can say a fair amount about their course after the onset of the first episode. And much of the functional deterioration that people will experience in their lifetimes happens in those first three to five years after the first episode of psychosis, after which typically the course is one of slow recovery. And um, much of the work in early intervention services has been to try to lift the plateau that people often reach in usual care services uh, to a higher level so that recovery can proceed without the, uh, the large losses that people sustain in vocational social functioning. In, in this uh, domain, obviously, reducing delays to care is one of two uh, interventions, I would argue, that should be part of modern early intervention services. Just a bit of history of a very crowded slide, mostly as a way to remind you um, to provide you some background of wh where we are coming from. 
we began in, in 2006 um, as a pilot first episode service within the Connecticut Mental Health Center, which, uh, like the Mass Mental Health Center, is a public academic collaboration. And um, at the time, we were aware of evidence from the UK and Denmark, uh, which had each conducted randomized control trials of uh, very intensive ACT level services for first episode psychosis and demonstrated um, effectiveness. And we uh, worked with our commissioner at Demas at the time to open up a pilot clinic in 2006. And in 2007, with some funding from the Donahue Foundation and later from the NIH, completed a pragmatic randomized control trial or began, sorry, and completed this in 2013 that sought to test a more um, watered down ambulatory office-based approach, unlike the no, the Denmark, the Danish, and the uh, British studies that we thought was better suited to the realities of US public sector care. So this was a pragmatic intervention with uh, pragmatic outcomes, measures of hospitalization and vocational functioning and, and a few others, but we picked outcomes that we thought would be salient to policy at the public sector level in the US. And also, uh, you know, broadly speaking, pragmatic sampling, which is that we randomized individuals who ordinarily presented to care at a place like CMHC, uh, where one group went to a first episode service we called STEP, and the other group received usual care, whatever that care might be, depending on insurance status in the community. Um, I will not present the results of that study, but on the heels of that study, we then uh, launched another uh, in study that I'm going to talk about today, which was to shorten the delays to care. So we established first the effectiveness of our service and felt confident enough to now think about driving down DUP uh, to this service. And, and that campaign was run from 2015 to 2019. And with the start of that campaign effectively in 2015, we converted our clinic into a population-based service, by which I mean we are open to anyone who lives in a 10-town uh, area surrounding our clinic, regardless of insurance status. Um, and our goal is to really include everyone into our service as quickly as possible, uh, uh, for which the access intervention is what I'm going to describe uh, to you uh, now. So I'm going to cover some elements of the design of the campaign. Many of you are already familiar with this. Of course, some of you helped me design it, uh, but I thought it might be useful to just go over that as a prelude to describing then the implementation and then some of the results. So we uh, mimicked the design of the TIPS campaign uh, that had two intervention sites that, that launched early detection in Norway and two control sites, one in Norway and one in Denmark. And the conceit of that study was uh, they were really focused on testing whether shortening DUP would improve outcomes. The clinical services themselves were broadly comparable. They were not enriched. They would not be considered coordinated specialty care services today, but they broadly had the kinds of elements that were provided to individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And the goal was to test whether the campaign specifically reduced DUP and it was important for them uh, to have two elements. One was a contemporaneous control. So unlike most studies before and most studies after, uh, DUP was not compared to a historical control sample, uh, especially in systems like the US and even in Norway, there was an understanding that stochastic changes, changes in regulation, uh, local changes in referral patterns, could change DUP that might be misattributed to an early detection intervention. Um, and the other aspect was a commitment to a community level DUP reduction, by which I mean, they were not seeking to shorten delays in some pre-specified component of the care pathway, either say from GPs to specialist mental health services or general community mental health teams to first episode services but they were really interested in reducing DUP for a whole region. Um, and I refer to this as community level DUP. 
And, and again, uh, in these respects, STEP mimicked TIPS. Um, and I, as I understand it, we are the only two interventions so far that have actually sought to and successfully reduced community level DUP. There is another study from Singapore that did something very similar to TIPS, uh, but without a contemporaneous control. Uh, they simply compared their results to historical DUP, uh, which, you know, depending on where you are in which part of the world might be a reasonable assumption. We did not think in the U.S. that we could get away from having a contemporaneous control, given the complexity of factors that influence delays in our um, systems that do not have uh, GPs as gatekeepers, but people can really come to care from anywhere. Um, we also did not have any bets to place on which components were the biggest sources of delay. And like TIPS, we decided to take a, um, a broad approach. Uh, a less charitable description would be we took a kitchen sink approach. We tried to attack every source of delay at the same time with the goal of reducing overall DUP. Um, you can see, uh, um, you know, we, we uh, as part of the, the design, we were, the, the Norwegian group was very kind to actually invite some of us over uh, uh, before our launch and we were able to meet their teams. And it impressed us very quickly that um, Norway is not nearly as densely populated as the two regions here. So one advantage we had was we did not have to send teams out into distant rural areas to capture the same number of cases as they did in uh, in Rogaland. Um, so it, it, it did have implications in some ways for how broad we needed the campaign to be to gen generate enough referrals to have an adequate sample size to test whether our intervention actually reduced uh, DUP. I can say more about this, but uh, Broadly speaking, um, we had similar uh, patients prior to the study. Uh, the PrEP clinic uh, in Boston had reported demographically very similar um, populations as ours in terms of both illness severity, but also socio-demographic, socio-economic status. So in many ways, uh, uh, as close to an ideal control site as we could find. So in, in thinking about how to build a campaign, there's a lot more to say here. And I I um, I didn't want to, to I, I'm happy to drill down if there are questions, but broadly we needed a heuristic model. And this is a very simplified version of a patient and their mother typically who begins to experience the onset of psychosis, aren't, aren't quite sure yet what this is, don't yet know if this is something that requires treatment. And in the case of the patient may not think this is an illness at all, the dotted line indicates their first interaction with a node within the community, which in this case is the police. Um, and the situation might be a young man who's acting disorganized on the street and um, causes alarm amongst their neighbors. They call the police. This person is brought in sometimes to jail. And if they're lucky, diverted to the local ER uh, where the dotted line ends. And that's the end of the, of the so-called demand side of the pathway where no healthcare provider has yet come onto the scene. What begins after is what we call the supply side of the pathway where uh, healthcare providers who could in theory diagnose and begin treatment for psychosis have arrived on the care pathway. And what happens after can also cause a lot of delay, uh, both in terms of recognition treatment, but also referral to the endpoint for our study, which was to the local coordinated specialty care clinic, and STEP is, is a stand-in for that here. So what we were interested in is thinking about um, the various components of this pathway that we would have to uh, change in order to reduce the DUP. Uh, I should add that um, some of this work uh, had, uh, the thinking about these kinds of models have been done in the UK, mostly around uh, care pathways uh, between primary, secondary, and tertiary care. But one of the ideas uh, that I really liked from this from this idea was not to conceive of these different nodes as passive barriers that would or would not help us in shortening delay, but also as very active filters, uh, which is to say they acted differentially on different individuals with psychosis based on factors extraneous to their illness. Um, a young African-American male acting disorganized in an urban street 
would be handled with uh, in a different way and in fact brought in by the police much more quickly either to jail or the ER than a uh, much less physically imposing quiet female with mostly negative symptoms in the suburbs and the thinking was broadly that each of these nodes needed to be empowered and educated to act on behalf of our patients, but they might already be acting in ways that could either be leveraged or would need to be addressed in some way uh, in, a, in our campaign. Um, so I'm, I'm, I put a slide here just to describe sort of broad principles. Um, I mentioned already the idea of population health, thinking about the whole population of new cases in an entire region. Um, we, I'll say more about this, but we really thought of this as a complex intervention. While there were broad principles uh, within which we delivered mind map, we fully expected that many parts of these interventions would be, in fact, designed to change over the course of the campaign in response to uh, feedback uh, from the networks that we were seeking to change in terms of their referral patterns. And Hopefully this will become clear as I go on. Uh, the strategy we use is broadly described as social ecological. It's a fancy way of saying uh, we did try to discover the actual nodes in the community that we thought might be sources of delay and devise ways to have them refer to us. And while we had broad ideas of who this would be, uh, we had to actually do some work on discovering, for example, that a local um, after-school squash study program was an important node in our region that we would have to think of ways to uh, facilitate referrals from them. So, so the actual community agencies uh, that were in our region that uh, for whatever reason uh, that we didn't know before we started the campaign would become important partners in getting people into care to us quickly. In terms of a theory of change, there are obviously theories of change that we're all familiar with uh, at the micro level, how to get people to change uh, what they eat, change exercise, change their behaviors around use of substances. And there are stages of change models and so on, but they there was um, no evidence or what little, little evidence existed suggested that these were fairly important when it came to macro level changes. They did not help describe how to change the behaviors of groups of people in a community. And the campaign literature um, from other conditions, you know, helping uh, reduce the incidence of unsafe sexual practices, for example, smoking reduction campaigns, anti-stigma campaigns, um, was really unclear about which way to go in terms of what might induce large communities to change what they do, which is what we needed to happen for this campaign. So within the context of a broad social, social ecological strategy, we actually did not have a theory of behavior change that we expected would describe what would happen to patients, for example, or what should happen to others. And when it comes to psychotic illness, I think this is really a strength. Um, believing that educating a person that they might be ill and then helping them develop the motivation to seek care and then hoping they will eventually arrive to get care is a prescription for prolonging the DUP with illnesses where insight might emerge after treatment and in fact might be the product of treatment uh, rather than a requirement to engage in treatment. And so in this regard, we found social marketing as a really good fit as a persuasion strategy, essentially how to better sell mental health services to a young population that is already suspicious of healthcare providers in general, but um, also we're working against the uh, built environment and the processes of the mental health care system that uh, advertises its care very poorly uh, in terms of the public perception. So, so we took a, a very deliberately marketing approach that you'll see in the, in the campaign messaging. So what do we actually do? This is getting on to the implementation. Um, Broadly, we had three components. We had a public education component, which we imagine would most directly target the demand side of the pathway. It turns out this was not exactly the way it worked, but uh, our, our notion was the young man in the basement who's having symptoms, who isn't, hasn't told anyone yet what's happening, could only be reached through media. And we were trying to message in that way and to his friends. Um, 
we the other component was professional outreach and detailing, which is really a version of what pharmaceutical companies have known uh, and have used very effectively for many, many years, forming relationships with key partners uh, and on the basis of those relationships, uh, facilitating conversations to get referrals uh, to the clinic. So it isn't necessarily about educating the person as much or motivating them, but forming a trusting relationship where if they think about the medication, they might call you and then you might send them prescription doses and make it easy for them to prescribe. Very much in the same vein, we welcome calls from people who, who thought they had seen something that might be psychosis. And even if they were wrong eight out of 10 times, the response was friendly, encouraging, um, so that they would call us the other two times when they might actually find someone with psychosis and we could uh, take them in. And the final leg was really, a, a frankly, a quality improvement intervention to reduce wait times at our front door. And this is a common finding in clinics, even ones that are focused on particular populations, that between the time that the person is eligible and when they begin treatment, um, weeks to months can elapse for a variety of reasons. And we engage in very active problem solving, including providing Uber rides if necessary and addressing a whole host of factors that uh, collude with the patient's reluctance to come to care anyway. And so we found that if we couldn't bring them in within a week, we we would very likely lose them completely uh, because this ambivalence about getting treatment can only be broken by having them come into the building and realize that we don't shock people against their will. We don't lock them up. So all these fantasies that young people who've never been in our system have about our system can only often really in the end be addressed by bringing them into the store and showing them what happens. Um, so this was a very important part of our effort, even if in the scheme of the overall DUP, this may not have had a big, huge impact. So some of the messaging, um, and all of this is archived on our website, uh, which I'll, I can share in the end, it's mindmapct.org. Um, but we used a variety of messaging and you'll see that that it had a kind of a common um, logo framing. It looked like it was part of the same campaign. It was designed to be colorful and simple and shareable on social media. Um, and it always had a call to action, which is the number at the bottom left. So the only way we invited referrals was a phone call. So not emails, not texts, although people could certainly email us. But uh, we wanted them to speak to a person as quickly as possible who could help both determine eligibility, but often problem solve with some bystander or family member to help get the consent of the person to actually induct them into the clinic. Um, we did try to target patients directly, but also their peers and then family members um, in, in with different kinds of messages. And uh, top left is a screenshot of uh, an earlier version of our website. Uh, top right is a graphic that kind of tries to show what treatment is like uh, because it's it was a mystery to most people. Or as I mentioned, they had ideas about treatment that were really not rooted in reality. Uh, there were some messages below that you could describe broadly as anti-stigma messages. Uh, but the, the force of the campaign was not really about reducing stigma it was about enabling people who think they might be seeing someone who's ill to have a number to call to be able to help. And our sense from discussions in the community was people actually mostly wanted to help. They just didn't know how. And they found it uh, uh, confusing, scary, and often demoralizing to be confronted with someone in their community and not know who to call. And when they did call, not get a call back and feel like they were not getting a, a response. So we worked very hard to respond to all calls within a working day um, and educate sometimes people about the resources they did have to help someone, often someone who was not psychotic. And so we, as I'll describe later, we 80% of our calls were unrelated to psychosis, but allowed us, I think, to get the other 20% that we wanted. Um, so as part, I'm still within the public education component of our campaign. Within that, we obviously made heavy use of media, so both uh, social and mass media. And for the social media piece, we own this website that we curated actively with messages that came from our uh, clinic. Um, we also uh, bought social media advertisements, and then we earned social media, which is really 
uh, organic sharing that you don't have to pay for. That's the ideal way to amplify the message. So just an example of what a social media campaign within the broader campaign can look like is uh, we developed a quiz on our website and then we developed a Facebook campaign to try to drive traffic to the quiz. And this is a way of assessing whether the messaging in that campaign was effective with the outcome being people who came to the quiz and took the quiz, which we could count on our website. And you're able to monetize these, of course, so you can look at the, the number of people it reached, uh, the number of clicks it generated, the cost per click. Um, and these can be done in parallel or in separate uh, serial attempts. And what we learned from these mini uh, social media campaigns was what kinds of messages uh, led to more clicks. And we used that as feedback to then put it on our other messages in mass and other media um, so in some way, getting a sense from the community of what kinds of messages uh, were landing. And then we also were able to time these to different events. So we could target students at the opening of the semester with messages that were more likely to get their attention at that time of year uh, that reminded them about the symptoms of psychosis and so on. Um, something you can do with paid targeting is also... Uh, this is a bit eerie, but uh, but is doable, is, is um, geocode the targeting and focus it on an area and broadly even know roughly where people are coming from to your messages, how they're getting to your, your website, for instance. We also use mass media and at a unit level, this was more expensive. So buying a spot on um, local TV, we, we turns out we didn't have to buy this one. We got it for free, but... Uh, but putting out ads in a newspaper, for example, or as we did, putting skins on local buses uh, were expensive. But I think mostly, ironically, we ended up being able to use this and pictures for our social media campaign. So having some kind of an actual presence physically in the community and a presence on traditional media was a good way to drive more activity on social media as well. Uh, we also did the, the very old-fashioned postcards were mailed to every single household in all 10 towns. We did a few rounds of this. This got expensive as, a, as again, a, a one kind of buy. Uh, but we discovered that there are people who actually still uh, look at their mail. And this is obviously going for an older demographic, not the patients themselves or their friends, but family members and such. So, uh, so we decided to do a few rounds of these. So that was that was one component. The other component, as I mentioned, is outreach and detailing. And we identified these broad stakeholder groups uh, around which we devised uh, distinct messaging. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But we understood that these different groups might see people with psychosis and have different educational needs um, to get them to be able to identify those people. But the call to action was the same. Just call this one number and we would work with anyone uh, to bring the person into care. We, we began these just for the sake of efficiency with big outreach events where we would invite people from all these stakeholder groups together. So on the top right was actually our campaign launch, Feb 1 of 2015. Uh, that's the then commissioner of Demas standing up and talking to representatives from the state legislature, the governor's office, leadership in our department, and then a whole host of members of these different stakeholder groups. And then we took pictures at this event, we took names and phone numbers down, and we used it as a way to then start detailing these individuals who had come to this event and seen that their peers were also there. Uh, so there's a bit of social buy-in if you see leaders in the community who uh, endorse the campaign by their presence. Uh, we also um, uh, sponsored local events, so at the bottom, Left and right is a very popular annual New Haven road race that pulls people from uh, the entire southern region. We sponsored a team. We had T-shirts, uh, handed out uh, pens, and also had people coming up to these tents where our clinicians um, would have very interesting conversations with people in the community about challenges with identifying or mostly accessing care for people with psychosis in a venue that was less intimidating. Um, and so I think that was a very useful aspect of being out in the community. Uh, the, the most common question we got was whether this was funded by a pharmaceutical company. People couldn't 
believe that a government funded program could look as sleek, I guess, as it as it did. So we had to reassure them that uh, that we were, uh, you know, a public sector campaign. Uh, we so we did many of these events and. Uh, it was important we found to feature our clinicians. So the the pictures on the top left and middle are uh, clinicians in our clinic who we brought to, for example, area restaurants where we had uh, representatives from the local police department, high school, uh, community college, and of course clinics have a chance uh, to ask questions of the clinicians. And this was a powerful way to let people know in the community what care actually consisted of, which was mostly talking to people. Um, and we found that this was a great way to increase the confidence of non-clinicians to make referrals to, to our clinic. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, giveaway items with the same call to action, our telephone number. Uh, we devised some of them based on feedback from the stakeholder group. So police, uh, for example, the police departments liked having tearaways uh, that they could carry in their cars and leave in homes if they thought there was someone there who could use our services. Um, but the the brains were the most popular by far. Uh, I have no idea what they were used for, but uh, people really liked them. <laughs> um, and finally, the, the third component, I can say more about this. We have published about it, but this was really classic quality improvement. We met every week as a team. Uh, and our early detection team met with our clinical team uh, together to review uh, every admission on a weekly basis and specifically to talk about outliers, that is people who were admitted by the early detection team but had taken a, a week or more to connect and get admitted to the clinical team. Um, and we found that having these meetings uh, helped build a common ethos around what the purpose of the intervention was, but also supported the clinic, which essentially had given up control of its front door to this overall mission, uh, but understood why we were doing it. And it very quickly um, became part of the normal operation of the service. Uh, and we, we were able to drive down delay to well below seven days for most patients, but not all. And I'll, I'll present this in the results. Uh, I put this up just for people who are looking at the slides later on, some details about the design, but broadly 16 to 35, um, within three years of psychosis onset, uh, you know, we didn't work very hard to, to, to exclude people who were 3.2 or 3.5, but broadly we're looking at people within the um, early course of the illness uh, as targets to reduce uh, delay to care. So um, I'll move on to the results. I can't see any of you, but um, uh, Kelsey, feel free to interrupt me if there's a question you think I should respond to as I'm proceeding. Otherwise, I'll I'll try to finish up in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes and then take questions in the end. Sure, sounds good. Okay. Um, so in terms of results, first in the media uh, sort of uh, ecosystem, how would we assess the effectiveness of the media campaign? And this is a bit tricky uh, in part because by design, we did not want anyone to reveal their identity while they were clicking on our messages online. And so this is very different from traditional social media campaigns for, say, a shoe company where you click on the advertisement and it takes you to their site. And if you make the purchase, then the team knows exactly which messages led to a purchase because that customer's tracked all the way through. Uh, we had to have a firewall uh, where when people made it into the clinic, we were able to identify them, of course, and get data. But we we had to rely on their memory to tell us how they heard about us, and we couldn't really track them online. Um, we felt that asking them to reveal themselves would just limit the number of people who came to our site and, and uh, sought out care. But we were able to track many metrics, uh, you know, the number of website visits, uh, when you pay for a site, you can track whether people come to you directly via any of a number of Facebook campaigns. This is a bit out of date. It's not the whole campaign, but I'm just showing it to you for illustrative purposes. This was roughly the proportion. And then we saw changes quarter to quarter uh, as we, for example, ran a Twitter campaign. We might see an increase in that bar, uh, but we it, it helps to know how traffic is being driven to the site you own as a rough proxy of how effective those messages are in uh, getting people to act in some way, act being simply here, clicking and going to a website. You're, we're able to track whether our messaging was 
coming from the region that we were actually targeting. And broadly, you can see most of it was happening in the 10 towns. But of course, with a media campaign, it goes all over the place. Uh, we were getting referrals even from outside the US. But broadly, uh, we were able to constrain it to the region we were targeting. Uh, I already mentioned the fact that if you pay, you can do this kind of geofencing. Um, and some, some I'll give you just a flavor of how what kinds of metrics would help you know about these social media efforts. So you can track impressions, which is really just a vanity metric. You know, about 5 million people had our messages show up on unique IP addresses. They may not have looked at it. You know, we don't know what it really means, but you, you can get that metric. Engagements refers to the person having actually done something with the message, either shared it or clicked on it. Um, and then you could track visitors to the website that come from Facebook. And it looked like on average, our engagement rate was at or above the industry average when it comes to commercial campaigns. So our messages were reasonably good, um, or at least as good as what most commercial messages. We were all also able with the paid portions of our campaigns to track who's looking at this broadly demographically. So even back then, Facebook was skewing older. It's If we did this today, we'd probably be even an older distribution. So this is clearly mostly not hitting target patients, but probably their families and the clinicians uh, around them. Similarly for Twitter, there's the very equivalence, as you can see, ways to track a performance of your messaging campaign. And a bit, bit bimodal in, during the course of our campaign in terms of the age distribution, but again, skewed likely above the age of our target patient population. Uh, YouTube was, we discovered, by far the place that people spent the most time on in terms of just sheer number of minutes on a, on a message. And so we actually, in response to this, increased the number of YouTube videos we started producing and putting out. Um, and uh, it skewed a little bit younger, but not that much, again, in our in our catchment area. So there are many ways to roll up all these social media metrics. This is just one way to do it, uh, looking at impressions, engagements, website visits, quiz takers, quiz completion. So this was sort of a quiz-centric way of asking the question, how, how, how good was our funnel? But there will be many other ways to think about this. Um, but again, as I mentioned, the, the limitation here is we didn't really track them from this point all onwards into the clinic directly. This is the real scoreboard. Um, so the actual number of calls that were generated to us from all the components of the campaign. And I guess the, the takeaway here um, that I should maybe emphasize is uh, if you look at the number of people, number of calls we took, and then of those, we were able to assess the vast majority. So there'll always be calls of people where you call them back, you can't reach them. You don't even know if they're calling about a patient or they're calling about something else. Uh, but most of them we were able to reach and complete an assessment of eligibility for, determine whether they were or were not. And a small minority, was 16% were eligible. This is very much consistent with the experience and tips that they told us to be prepared for, is to have a very wide open funnel at the top to be able to find the people we needed to. So, you know, 84% of the work was really counseling and redirecting people to other resources because most of the calls were for people who were asking about mental health services broadly, um, but they, they were not related to psychosis. And in most cases, they knew that when they called us, they were just grateful to have someone call them back or speak to them on the phone and redirect them. Of those 16%, we were quite successful at the front door in enrolling. So, so 91% were enrolled into care. Uh, so it, it was a sticky front door. Um, the ones we lost, very few actually refused um, care, uh, which is a reassuring number given that the vast majority didn't even think they were ill. And it goes to this issue of marketing. We were not saying to them, as I'm sure we all don't, uh, that you can only come to care if you acknowledge you have a psychotic illness. We didn't even uh, make that a relevant factor in how we pitched care to them. Um, so that refusal rate, is, it should be reassuring. Uh, lack of insight is not an impediment to reducing DUP. Um, and then there were some, of course, that were our, uh, uh, us falling down, the 0.9% the that were just lost to enrollment. We couldn't find them after having determined that they were eligible. see here I seem to have now oh here we go uh, uh, some numbers um, 
I didn't include uh, campaign year four here. Just to be clear, we had four years of campaigning, but the trends were broadly similar. So you'll see uh, the campaign did result in a significant increase in the number of referrals. Um, and we did ask people where they heard about us from. We wanted to know which parts of the campaign were less or more successful. And you'll see broadly that uh, we were attributing most of the successful enrollments to our outreach efforts to professionals in the community. Um, a growing percentage were in the blue zone. So I think if we had done this campaign for three or four more years, I suspect that proportion would rise over time. And it takes a while for campaign messaging to filter. But another factor here is when you ask people where they heard about your clinic, they will sometimes say things like, oh, I saw it in the New York Times. Um, we never advertise in the New York Times. So people might refer to something that they think uh, they read something about. And our suspicion was that much of our media campaign was effectively reaching uh, not just parents, as you saw in the demographic divide in Facebook and Twitter, but a lot of clinicians in the community who were very excited and also used our messaging and our website to show our clinic to patients who they were trying to get to us. And in a uh, interesting way, the fact that we had a big virtual presence reassured young patients that they should come to us, that we were real in some way. So having this kind of a very um, attractive virtual front door was helpful for clinicians who were trying to get patients to agree to, to, to call us. Um, so I, I said I would mention some. So this was the uh, some of the results from the third piece of our intervention. I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Um, so every dot on the screen is an individual patient. And on the y-axis is the number of days from when they were considered eligible to when they were admitted into the clinic for, for care. And you'll see that, um, so the red line has um, the median pre-launching of the campaign, and the pink line is the years after during the campaign. So you'll see on average, we were able to bring the median delay below the green line, which was our seven-day target. But of course, we did not eliminate uh, massive delays in individual cases. And so those remained, but they were often individuals where um, either we discovered we had dropped the ball in some way and we remedied that going forward in sort of a QI approach, or in some cases, they were really about the individual patient and their ambivalence about treatment that required extended engagement, sometimes over months to get them to agree to come in. But the point is we, every week, talked about these cases to see if we could learn anything about how we might better market our services at the front door and reduce delay for the next uh, admission. Um, uh, this is, uh, right, so <laughs> there's a lot of uh, terminology around DUP and some groups use DUP one, two, and three, and uh, people measure it and cut it up in different ways. So this is the way we did it, uh, DUP total being the time from psychosis onset to admission to step. Um, DUP demand was psychosis onset to the first prescription of an antipsychotic for psychosis, not for sleep or some other nonspecific indication. And the reason we picked that is that's a reliable, easy to measure proxy for when we think uh, the healthcare system has arrived on the pathway, or at least someone in the healthcare system who thinks they're looking at psychosis as measured by their decision to prescribe an antipsychotic. Not perfect, but at least a reliable way to get a sense of when did someone think they were actually um, uh, had psychotic symptoms. And then uh, the time from that first prescription to entry into step, we we termed as DUP supply as a way of saying they, these are all the ways in which the healthcare system could um, has has led has caused delay. And so it provides a a different uh, kind of set of targets for a campaign to go after versus the DUP demand side. So this taxonomy was really built with an interventionist perspective in mind, which is, can we break this up in ways that would inform actions we might use within a campaign to further reduce delay? Um, we also measured um, APS onset, and I'll say more about that. So we also had some measures of duration of illness uh, going back to the, to the clinical high-risk state. So uh, at the start, baseline DUP was broadly comparable at PrEP and STEP as we had expected from our uh, prior uh, work during the grant submission phase. Um, and you know it's, it's high. Um, uh, as you might expect, and not necessarily higher than U.S. averages, but but quite long. 
Um, I, this is a, a difficult table to digest. It's, it's published. I just put it up there for people who want to look at the slides later. Uh, but what were the results? And um, I can come back to this table during the Q&A, but I'll present the figures that might be easier to, to interpret. So we broke up the DUP distribution into quantiles. Um, and this was part of the design of our study because we expected, uh, based on the TIPS data, actually, that a campaign might be effective at reducing some sections of delay. But if we just looked at uh, mean delay, we might conclude that it didn't change the mean. And this would be a, a kind of a type two error. So we wanted to avoid that kind of an error by uh, pre hoc breaking up the distribution and looking at the effects across these different quantiles. So um, this is from the published paper. But the broad um, takeaway here is that we saw broadly trends over the course of the campaign. So left to right is time on the x-axis. And as you might expect in a campaign, the effects will should be accumulating over time as the message penetrates in a community. So it, it isn't really like an, a simple intervention where you start the medication and you expect the effects to start. And we wanted to see time trends. And what we found were trends over time of DUP reduction in a, at a trend level across all the three quantiles. So the, the second quantile is the median, uh, which is the orange uh, uh, line. But um, in terms of uh, statistical power, we were able to show uh, significant reductions in, quant in the quartile one and two. So uh, in terms of uh, ease of interpretation, I hope it helps to say that we were able to reduce it by 11 and a half days in the shortest uh, quantile and, and about two months in the middle quartile. Um, and these measures remain largely unchanged across all the distribution levels at, at PrEP. Um, a more easily interpretable, but probably not as accurate way to say this is that the median DUP fell from 312 to 149 days at step. Um, versus at PrEP, uh, it looks like an increase, but it isn't really. It, it stayed flat at, um, at PrEP during the course of the campaign. Uh, these, these figures were broadly consistent, which was reassuring to us across DUP demand and DUP supply. So the, the components of DUP that we measured and intervened also reduced in the same direction. Uh, in both cases, both demand and supply, um, we were able to measure measurably reduce DUP at the highest end of the range, which is what you might expect. Um, in, in our uh, region, and I'll go back to the table here, if I can draw your attention to DUP supply and the line that says median uh, Q1, Q3, so right in the middle of the table, you'll notice something that we discovered only after we started running the campaign for a while, which is the DUP supply at step starting off was actually already quite low. Uh, we were able to reduce it over the campaign but the DUP supply at PrEP was really not comparable. Um, so in this way, uh, the, the control side was not actually starting off at the same place. And it remained the same. It didn't change, as you might expect. So um, in some ways, this validates our approach of going after supply and demand and not, uh, like many other campaigns around the world, picking one component and betting that focusing on that for example, GP to specialist care uh, delay would actually reduce DUP um, because it's clear here that depending on wh which site you're at and where you begin, you might need to target both. Uh, I would say ideally both, or you might decide to target the one that's the longest um, that you think you'd get the most bang for your for your buck. So bottom line, we what we saw broad and very um, encouraging reductions across both components and overall DUP. And, and this is sort of the slide that I think we've, we've put out for easy interpretation. If you think in days or weeks or months, um, broadly, we were able to have DUP across this 10 town catchment over the course of the campaign. And we, we do believe this was the campaign uh, because we've, we had historical DUP at step, uh, but also we had contemporaneous DUP at PrEP, which did not show this change over time. Um, how does this compare in terms of effect size and, and baselines? So the biggest sample of DUP in the US was from the RAISE Navigate study. They, they weren't, uh, of course, trying to reduce DUP, but they measured it across multiple community clinics. And 
uh, had a, uh, reported a median of 74 weeks. So half their patients in the Raise Navigate study had a DUP longer than 74 weeks. Uh, the DUP at PrEP, our control type was broadly comparable. So we believe we used a control that's ecologically relevant. Um, and we were able at, at step to have it. Um, our effect size in relative terms is comparable to TIPS. They went from 10 to five weeks, although they started at a much lower DUP than we did. Um, TIPS, unlike us, did not um, restrict people to within three years of psychosis onset. So they had DUPs that went much, uh, much further out than that. And so their third quartile had a much bigger range and ability to show difference. But in their second quartile, they their absolute reduction in DUP was a reduction of 11 weeks, which is not very far from what we achieved at STEP in terms of an eight-week absolute reduction in DUP. So broadly speaking, I think we, we think this was a successful replication in a very different system, um, which is the U.S., and also uh, with the use of social media that wasn't around at the time that TIPS was, was implemented. Uh, lessons learned now. Uh, how am I doing for time, Kelsey? Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, sure. You can uh, wrap up in the next couple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these are just my some slides of publications that have emerged. Uh, many of you have been involved in these. So, but things we've learned along the way. This is a graphical um, network figure that displays, I think, what many of us already suspect. So onset on the left is when we date the onset of psychosis, and all the way to the right is step, the destination. And the thickness of the routes is based on the number of trajectories taken by patients. So it's not individual patients, it's it's number of pathways added up. On the periphery, the blue nodes are community nodes and the red nodes are clinical nodes. And unsurprisingly uh, to us, based on our prior experience, the, the big pathway was uh, to the emergency department and then from the emergency department to the inpatient unit and then to step. So we would like to hope that over time, if we continue doing this, uh, that pathway becomes less salient uh, and we would find people before they required mostly involuntary admissions to get to step. Uh, but you could see here that many different um, stakeholders were involved as nodes in this pathway to care that we were seeking to organize essentially into a into a coherent pathway. We would all know where to send the person, um, ideally, uh, to a place that can provide evidence-based care. So. So there's that, and we're, we're building a tool based on this that would give this kind of a visualization in real time to clinics. So if they were willing to collect this information about pathways to care, uh, they would be very quickly able to see a visual representation emerging before them of their region, which clinics may not have a full view of without actually collecting this data. Um, another lesson we learned, this is a paper that uh, validated, uh, I mean, our, it it um, uh, it helped us um, to have used the SIPs where we also got information about the onset of CHR. And what we found is that um, people who, so these were all people who ended up with psychosis um, eventually, but the people who sought care during the CHR phase before they became psychotic were more likely to seek care themselves. So the patients themselves were much more likely to be initiators of help seeking, which is a much more voluntary process versus after the onset of psychosis where it skewed much more heavily towards family members who are bringing people in. And so it's an interesting finding about what we might, how we might differently think of help seeking in these different phases of illness and the different opportunities that might exist to bring people into care in uh, less aversive ways into, into clinics. Uh, this is a paper we recently published um, about looking at um, hospitalization rates uh, pre-post entry into STEP, which is the red line. So this is a swim chart, and you can see most people who were admitted uh, in the year before coming to STEP were not admitted again in the year after. But there was a group at the bottom uh, that were admitted several times, sometimes for long periods. And we one of the analyses was to look at whether DUP moderated this effect, and indeed it did across all different components, which is the longer the DUP, the less effective the clinic was at reducing hospitalization. And we also found that of the measures of DUP, a prolonged DUP supply was the, was the only predictor of whether or not you were hospitalized after admission. Um, so it, 
it's um it's a finding in a in a sample that needs to be replicated in a larger group but it's interesting in terms of thinking about which components have the greatest impact on which outcomes um and you know there there are reasons we can think about that this might have happened and we can talk about um this is a paper that emily klein at, at your side led uh, for us which is we were all also able to look at when cannabis use began in relation to the onset of the CHR state and then in relation to the onset of psychosis. Uh, so these are secondary analysis based on all the data we were collecting. Uh, you won't be surprised to see a very high prevalence of cannabis use, uh, but we were surprised to find how that most people began use before even an identifiable CHR state, which has implications for ideas about self-treatment. It, it, it appears that many were using well before there would be a reason to treat psychosis-related symptoms. Um, and, and I think this is not a surprising finding, which is the earlier the use, uh, the worse things got, and the worse the use was at the time of admission as well. So I'm summarizing here. Uh, we were able to reduce community DP. That reduction was progressive, which gave us more confidence that this was also a campaign effect. Uh, we believe the amount of reduction is meaningful. Uh, there, it's feasible to integrate to a CSC. I mean, uh, much rides on that word feasible, but I think it was doable within the context of an existing, established, experienced, and busy first episode clinic to, to add the early detection component on. Um, wait times, this is something that can be done without a fancy campaign. Uh, clinics can do this now within their resources to reduce wait times. Uh, we, we've confirmed what we suspected, that these pathways are really regionally quite idiosyncratic and they do change over time. Um, and uh, we, we believe that demand and supply should be measured and looked at separately um, because they can be targeted separately uh, as a cause of delay. So this is, I believe, my yeah, my second to last slide. I, I can leave this up here. I, I think some lessons, I, since I know you're all thinking uh, from an implementation point of view and not just uh, you know results of our papers. Um, I think one lesson we learned, and Kesh and I have talked about this, is that um, usual detection has a cost, which is that actually over time, usual detection can actually lead to not maintenance of the status quo, but, but reductions in... Uh, intakes and also greater loss to intakes. And so there's something about the illness and the nature of our uh, of the way our healthcare systems are um, presented to patients um, that not doing an active campaign actually uh, means you might actually lose ground over time. And conversely, doing the campaign didn't just lead to more referrals. It also got our front door much better at retaining referrals. Um, the I, I mentioned this before. I, I you know there's a lot of um, discussion uh, about how to measure DUP, and I I don't believe there's one perfect way to do it. But the advantage of the SIPs was that it's very reliable about dating psychosis onset. As many of you know, the POPs criteria are uh, operational and easy to understand in a way that um, is not rivaled by many other uh, assessments. It also gives you the benefit of dating CHR, which has uh, analytic usefulness, as I've presented some results. Um, and uh, it helps us understand, uh, right, pathways before and after, cannabis use before and after, and so on. Uh, maybe the, the big takeaway I'd say is that ED efforts need to be really long, multi-year. They take a while to accumulate their effects. Um, they need to be wide, which is makes them a little more resource intensive. And they really need to be conceived of as complex interventions, um, interventions that change in response to what networks do or don't do in response. So they have to have the capacity to be uh, iterative in the way that they deliver uh, their interventions. Um, I think that uh, we, um, one way to have done such a campaign uh, might have been to uh, collect a lot of information through surveys, phone calls um, with the community to understand all the different barriers to care and to get uh, information and suggestions and feedback and advice on how to then construct a campaign to reduce those barriers. And no doubt that would have produced useful information. But what we found was that actually launching the intervention revealed allies and barriers that would not have been apparent without actually having the intervention going. And so this sounds a lot like making up um, or, or you know building the plane as you've taken off. But uh, we thought of this as really an, um, an interventionist approach, which is 
we really care about uh, those nodes that are influential on delays and then targeting them. And it's hard to discover who they are until you actually launch a campaign, given the way that data is structured in uh, disaggregated healthcare systems in the in the US. Uh, and then the question I'll, I'll leave with is really around sustainability. We saw, as you can see, continuous trends in reduction. Uh, we were we had designed the the study to uh, to run for four years and then stop for a year uh, to see whether what would happen with the DUP. The Norwegians had had stopped inadvertently because of funding issues, and what they found was the DUP went right back up after they stopped, which actually um, helps further validate the causal impact of the campaign that this was actually related to the campaign. And we had the same finding. We stopped the campaign in 2019 as designed. We didn't do any campaigning for a year and the DUP began to decay right back up to baseline. And as it happened at that point, COVID hit and there's another story to tell there, uh, but we had a full year um, to observe what happened to the DUP. And so this raises the question, if you have a campaign that's progressively reducing DUP and when you stop it, it climbs back up after not much time, one needs to think about building a sustainable early detection effort as part of an early intervention service uh, in order to keep DUP um, low. Um, our, where we've gone from here in terms of our service design specifically is early detection is now seen as part of our first module in the community of what we do. Uh, we added a evaluation um, and assessment component, mostly uh, as a way to help community clinics, but Broadly speaking, early detection followed by CSC, uh, and then for us, a care transition module because we can't keep people longer than three years at most uh, in our system of care. Uh, it's so, so we've sort of built this into our early intervention services uh, package, if you will. Uh, so we, we used Redrock. A lot of the messaging was, well, all the messaging you saw, the websites, uh, was uh, done by a marketing team in New Haven. Um, I, I can't say enough about our collaborators in, in Norway who are very generous in sharing um, all kinds of materials and experiences with us. Um, the team, I, I have, don't have enough pictures of the different generations of trainees who were involved, but uh, the Barbara Walsh in the Prime Clinic that many of you know, and Philip Markovich, who was our main um, outreach coordinator. And then all of you, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, Kesh and Larry and Emily as a stand-in for many, many people I know in the Boston side who are crucial to this effort. Um, and I think that's my, yep, that's my last slide. So I'll, I'll leave it here maybe. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Vinod. That was uh, really a um, delicious full meal, if you might call it, because I had not heard the full um, study details um, almost until now. I've heard bits and pieces of that at different times. It was, But there was one piece that was still missing that uh, would make it completely satisfying. And I'm sure you're looking at the data yet, which is what you alluded to at the very beginning. And that is the question of how this DUP reduction might actually have improved outcomes. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Of course. So do you have any inkling of that? So this would be the dessert. Um, <laughs> That's right. Um, I will say, you know, as a caveat that we were uh, funded and designed as a DUP reduction study. Um, and this second piece, which is did the DUP reduction add value? Uh, I'll say in the, in the review process, the reviewers at the time said, why are you bothering with that? We already know that if you reduce DUP, you'll improve outcomes. And it's it's ironic because these days, apparently, that's become controversial again, you know, does DUP. So I'm afraid we're now publishing an environment where our findings might be seen with more skepticism, but we also only have one year of follow-up after DUP reduction with a smallish sample. So with that caveat, um, there's a paper we have uh, that is in review now um, with a with an outstanding journal um, that... Um, uh, where we asked the question, does DUP reduction uh, improve presentations to care? So just on arrival to the CSC, tips had shown that people arrived with less suicidality and less negative symptoms uh, as a result of the DUP reduction. So what we have found is that um, there are some differences um, that are probably related to the campaign 
where people look at to be in a little less distress, but it's a complex finding. It looks like we found more people who had dramatic reductions in GAF over the prior year um, as a result of the campaign. Um, and so there are some minor differences, but not big measurable differences between those who were exposed to the campaign at STEP and those who were not. Some of this was underpowered um, in the comparison. But the other puzzling finding we had was that most of this difference was not mediated by DUP, which suggests that the campaign had other effects that we can easily imagine that were good or were important that didn't run through DUP. You could be brought to STEP as a result of the campaign in a better state, even if your DUP was prolonged because you didn't go through jail or you didn't go through an involuntary hospitalization. So that paper is, is emphasizing the fact that campaigns like this are about more than just DUP. Uh, they're about building a, a network of care that ushers people into treatment, uh, even if it's quantitatively not improved, it's qualitatively potentially better and might have someone uh, present to care more uh, interested in care. So, uh, but I'm not, that's the, that's the sales and marketing side of the data part, which is what we have. We are looking at uh, effects of DUP reduction on six month and 12 month outcomes. Um, and I think there we are, I'm, it's still, uh, we're still looking at the data. It looks like there's an effect at six months that you would expect, but not durable at 12 months. And it it doesn't, as far as we, we can tell so far, vary by site, which is reassuring, which is it's not a quality of treatment or site-based effect. It's a it's a DUP effect at six months. Yeah, it's good to know. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure there are others with questions. Please. Yeah, I've gotten a, a few questions, um, some of which you've answered um, already through the course of your talk. So thank you. Um, we have one in the chat. Um, asking, did you have to hire additional staff at the start or during the project to have consistent openings available within about a week of screening? So what kind of was the initial and then sustained staffing resources, et cetera, to actually, you know, have that kind of quality improvement? Yeah, so um, the um, that's it's a really important question. We didn't want to launch a campaign and then get our clinic flooded and not be able to care for everyone. Um, so we calculated about 40 new cases in our region every year that would come to us as a result, as a result of the campaign, 40 to 60. We ended up, and we needed a target sample size of about 35 a year, and that's about what we actually got. So uh, we were either very um, smart about the calculation or very lucky. Um, and with, with two years of treatment, which is what we limited it to during the campaign, uh, we had a steady state of about 65 to 70 patients census in the clinic, which is what our staffing model was built to sustain. And then we had a backdoor where we discharged people um, after two years, which um, was another quality improvement initiative we brought out is what to do with people when they're done with first episode services and how to get them on to the next. So you don't uh, silt up the service and, and make the clinic much more nervous about letting people in. Um, staffing, uh, staff to patient ratios was never went above one, uh, never went below one to 25. It hovered in that region. Um, occasionally there were 30 patients to a clinician, but roughly 20 to 25 during the course of the campaign. Um, yeah. And we, so we were able to sustain three to four admissions a month. There was one month where we got eight, but that was an outlier. So uh, but in general, it was manageable. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, and then related to uh, kind of right at the end, you were talking about the sustainability. So that finding that, you know, when you stop the campaign, um, you start to see kind of a return back to that baseline. Um, and so I know it's been several years now since the end of the study itself. Um, so where are you at right now with things? How are you kind of ongoing doing this work? Um, and then to Kara's question in the chat, um, how do you maintain that reduction kind of after uh, the kind of initial campaign is over? Yeah, so our plan was initially, you know, we do the campaign for four years, we wait a year and we see what the results are. If, if the DUP kept trending downward, then we'd celebrate victory and go home. We expected it would go back up, which it did. And then we thought when it goes back up, we can think about um, finding ways for uh, 
you know, state or federal funds uh, to help us continue some piece of the campaign as a service intervention, because we thought we've shown it works. We've shown that when we stop, things get worse. Um, but at the at that end of one year, COVID hit. And so things completely changed for a while. So we've kind of been on pause about how to launch the next iteration of mind map. Um, and as it turns out, we're now uh, building a learning health network across the state with agencies across the state. So we hope to soon be launching 2.0 across the state, but in phases in regions across the state, uh, maybe in like a step wedged kind of design. So we're not launching it at step yet because we want to do it now in a statewide um, sort of manner. What we would do, we're, we're actually now in active conversations with um, our team and with Red Rock uh, to decide how to build a more, um, a less costly campaign that we could potentially sustain, you know, as part of a routine um, effort. So really, yeah, building this into the broader system of care for mm -hmm. clinics. And that actually goes really well into um, the next question here, which is about, so you did get a lot of calls you mentioned from outside of that small catchment area, even, you know, some you said out of the country, but so it sounds like from what you just said, you're expanding to other parts of Connecticut, at least. So how did you manage those kind of outside of catchment calls and what, what kinds of support would you recommend for that? Yeah. So if they were out of state, we relied a lot on uh, SAMHSA's, um, treatment locator, um, and of course, personal relations with colleagues and clinics around the around the country. Uh, if they were out of the country, that got a little complicated, but uh, sometimes it was relationships with other <laughs> academics and clinics around. Um, within the state, but outside our 10 town catchment, that was the most painful. Um, and I think there we we referred people to uh, mostly local mental health agencies. So Connecticut has five regions and the Department of Mental Health supports about 20 local mental health agencies that are a mix of state owned and private nonprofit agencies that have catchment responsibilities to take people in that catchment. Uh, some take people with insurance, some do not. And so for those who had insurance, it was often trickier to figure out where to send them. And often it was some version of look up your preferred provider list. Um, and it was very unsatisfactory. So in some ways that that data of uh, unmet need is what we leverage to get the state to consider a statewide learning health network. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that definitely is an ongoing struggle, I think, here as well for, you know, supporting people um, outside of catchment areas. Um, I think, you know, that that piece specifically around um, like having those relationships uh, at the outset being uh, is seems like a really important part of a campaign like this. Yeah. Um, and then we have one another question in the chat. Um, have you considered using Google ads or partnering with websites so that if somebody Googles psychosis or related keywords, um, the ad for, you know, the clinic or the campaign would pop up? Yeah. So there are ways to um, phrase your website text and other materials online to increase your likelihood of rising to the top, right? And and then you can pay for it. At the time, we didn't use it a lot, um, but I I think it's a it's a great idea to to uh, to consider now um, as a way to improve the profile. You know, I have to say, my there have I know this is not the question, but it's sort of related. Is there have been successful efforts to create virtual communities of people uh, with psychosis um, and uh, but my my reading of that literature at this point is that it still doesn't solve the problem of getting them into a bricks and mortar clinic for which we still need some um, in-person presence for treatment so at the time when we designed the campaign we we were very focused on we whatever it is you think you want to do call us because we want to talk to someone human and problem solved through all the myriad ways in which people will not come to care. Um, yeah, but I, I think uh, in terms of amplifying the message in a cheap way, if it's just that and the call to action is the same, uh, we could be a lot better in terms of leveraging um, websites. Yeah, and Google Ads is uh, is one way to do it. And it's not that expensive, depending on how you how you do it. 
Hmm, right. Yeah. Well, and especially, I mean, it was uh, interesting to see the age data. So really the the people who you were reaching were either parents or clinicians, you know, people who are still involved in the system, but not, um, you know, young people themselves. I mean, I know this uh, probably predated TikTok by mm -hmm. a few years, but are there any other kind of, um, you know, more youth focused things that you would recommend or think about now? Or, I mean, was reaching that more like clinician and parent population? I mean, it seemed to still help with reducing DUP. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I would say it's hard to know in advance. Uh, so I think having a broad panel of channels, which for us was a mix of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then we did these AMAs on Reddit that were actually quite... Um, quite fun to do and very interesting, but a much smaller kind of audience. Uh, and this is such a dynamic space, right? And there are always new. So within the context of getting out a clear message with a call to action, I think any of these channels, if they work, are great. Um, I was very anxious, and I'm not anymore, about risk of exposure, which is to say, we didn't want to invite patients to reveal too much on some website and then have a crowd after them that really didn't happen. Um, and I, I, but I think it's something to be careful about because we took some ownership of curating our digital space. And I don't know whether some of these channels are better than others. And so I'd have, we'd have to think about, you know, which ones we would want to use and which ones might um, sully the brand, so to speak. You know, we didn't want, um, yeah. So there's another question here from Hyun Young Kim. Uh, yeah, so uh, in the chat, I uh, asked uh, for professional outreach and detailing, did you have a designated staff member handling calls um, or did you find the support from a support seeking from professionals? So, you know, other clinicians uh, overwhelming and how did you manage that? You're muted. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, I think they're the the main um, implementers were actually our clinicians. But what I mean by that is we weren't sending them out a lot into the community other than these outreach events where they were very important um, members of the presentation crew. Um, so so but they were the face of the professional outreach. We wanted the professionals to be feeling like they were interacting with our clinicians. But my research staff, and because because this was a research grant, were the ones often arranging these events with the marketing team and following up with agency leadership and facilitating such contacts. I th I'd say in practice, most of the calls came into that unified number that was managed by my outreach coordinator. So it was rare that we had to pull one of our clinicians onto the phone to talk to that person. Uh, but the face we presented to the community was with our clinicians all the time, that they represented the, the clinic, if that makes sense. Yeah, that uh, brings me to my question. We probably have a couple more minutes. So, so <clears throat> going forward, uh, you know, to make this sustainable, um, you know, it seems to me one important thing would be to look at the relative cost of the different components of uh, what you did. There is the social marketing part, there is the public education part, the professional detailing, and the rapid access. Uh, are there some elements of this that are more expensive than the others um, that we could be looking at? Yeah, you know, it's 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 a challenging question because, so for example, we took out ads before one of the big movies. I can't remember which one that came out uh, because the marketing team thought it'd be a good way to target young people. Um, it was incredibly expensive and the best I could tell, it was mostly fellow faculty who had seen the ads. Um, so that was a spend we probably wouldn't have done then, but would we do it now? I'm not sure. It kind of depends on where you think the market is and what's worth the expenditure. So um, yeah, I almost feel like this is a, uh, it's easier to start with an actual budget and decide what you can do within that budget and then stop doing the things that didn't work and have quick ways to kill off bad ideas within the course of doing them because you will make mistakes and buy things and then no one wants them. Uh, so 
And the advantage, I guess, of social media is you can buy at a very low price and look at clicks. The disadvantage is you don't really know what the clicks actually mean because what you care about is patients in the clinic. And so there was a bit of that kind of, um, so I, I would say, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm being uh, annoyingly vague here, but uh, in the first year, we spent about $200,000. In the second year, we spent less than half of that because we stopped doing the silly things we, we tried in the first year that we thought would be great ideas and just went nowhere. Hmm. And then in the third year, we started getting offers of free media coverage uh, because people wanted to. So I, I guess it depends if you can get free coverage and if you think it's high yield, uh, you might not have to spend as much. Um, but but traditional media is always the expensive one. You spend a lot for something and you don't know what's going to happen with it. Uh, if you put an ad in a paper, you know what the circulation is, but you have no idea if they read it. Whereas if you put a Facebook ad, at least you can see who clicked on the message. Um, so it feels like that's more uh, resource efficient. But we also found that if we had something in the in the traditional media, people were more likely to be uh, driven to our website if we put that in our social media posts. So a Facebook post talking about me being on the radio meant that people would come to our website, even though they didn't hear the radio spot. Um, so I don't know if that's still the case, but it's sort of a media market sort of question. Yeah, thank you. The, the la last thought is, uh, you know, um, what do you think about using um, geolocation strategies to identify areas of higher need and areas where there is less services where when you one would presume that there is more likely to be long treatment delays and focus more of the costs of uh, you know professional detailing or public education to those kind of areas yeah no that's um massachusetts is a, is a much bigger state than connecticut um and so i think you if you had a subpopulation in a rural or sub rural area um you probably would want to tailor your messaging and your outreach, and it might look a bit more like the Rogaland approach. You might want to send out mobile teams to places to make contact because they wouldn't be willing to come all the way into your clinic until they felt they were, you know, um, getting a warm handoff. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, the the geocoding thing. I'm, you know, I guess we think we were thinking about it, Kesh, more in the context of using it to get a sense of social determinants based on using the geocoding to map onto public data about levels of crime, transportation networks, yeah. things like that. Um, but you can geocode people on your website that just gets into privacy issues. Like you know where they are, but you- No, what I was meaning was, uh, I think Kelsey and Ika have done this um, to map these available services at, to travel distances and so forth. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and see where, where there are less services available for population, larger populations and so on. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah. All right, we are at uh, one o'clock and uh, thank you very much. That was very stimulating presentation, Vinod. I'd always pick your brain again um, to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.